Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, a new national report contains the most detailed analysis of breast cancer to date. John? This report by four leading cancer groups in the U.S. offers a roadmap for targeting the disease more precisely. It includes key findings about who faces the greatest risk for breast cancer. Zelma Watkins was only 44 when a routine mammogram turned up something suspicious. The fact that I had a mammogram every year and they never had to take additional pictures, I was thinking that something was not quite right. Watkins had breast cancer. Oncologists divide breast cancer into four different molecular types that help determine treatment. The most common form with the best prognosis is treatable with hormonal therapy. But Watkins had the deadliest form, called triple negative, requiring intensive chemotherapy. Once they say the word cancer, you pretty much don't hear anything else. The report found black women have nearly twice the rate of triple negative breast cancer as white women, and the highest mortality rate from any form of breast cancer. Researchers used to think the poor outcome in blacks was due to higher poverty rates leading to delays in diagnosis and treatment. Dr. Lisa Newman is a surgical oncologist specializing in breast cancer. There were actually other clues that there might be some biologic differences in breast cancer as well. This report confirms that suspicion. Breast cancer afflicts African American women in different ways. Watkins volunteers with Sisters Network Inc., a group that does breast cancer education and outreach for black women. I don't know why I had triple negative breast cancer. It does not run in my family. But the fact that I was receiving my annual mammograms, it was detected at an early stage. John, how does this information help researchers? Well, on the one hand, now we know for sure there are different genetic subtypes, so you can have a more personalized approach. You, you don't just have one size fits all in terms of treatment. But also, even the deadliest form, this triple negative, if you catch it earlier, then you do better. You have a better prognosis. So that just says, look, especially for these groups, black women who are at the highest risk, you really want to do screening. Get them early. Next, a new call for immediate action on so-called lifestyle use of ADHD drugs. By one count, nearly 4.5% of American adults live with ADHD. That is lower than the rate for children, but millions more adults may be taking Ritalin and Adderall for everyday problems. I'd certainly heard of recreational use, but what is lifestyle use? Sure. Well, the main group of drugs used to treat ADHD are stimulants, and they change neurotransmitters in the brains of people who have the condition, and it helps them to focus. Uh, but now we're seeing people aiming to use the drugs who don't have ADHD because the drugs can give you short bursts of memory, concentration, motivation, energy. Uh, so we see a lot of people looking for the drugs so they can get a competitive edge at work. I often have busy, uh, overtired moms coming in saying these drugs might help me get through my day. Uh, and some people are even sourcing the drugs for weight loss. So what are the risks, though, Holly, of taking them, if there are any? You know, I think the top concern is that these drugs do have a huge potential for both addiction and abuse. Um, there can also be other serious side effects like high blood pressure and liver damage, even seizures. But I think the, the, the greatest concern that was raised in, in this article in The Lancet is that we have a lot of information about the risks and benefits of the drugs for people who have ADHD, and we have very little information about the risks and benefits for people who don't have the condition. So I think we have to reassess and make sure people who have the condition are getting treated and people who don't aren't. She mentions patients coming in asking for it. Does that mean that the only way to get these drugs is by a diagnosis of ADHD or do doctors prescribe them for other things? You're not supposed to prescribe it just for things like weight loss and having better attention, but uh, Holly, I'm sure you have the same pressure. People come in, come on, give me it. And, and, and by the way, I, I have ADHD, and the, the way I get around that is I say, fine, um, if you really do have it, because it certainly can benefit people who have the diagnosis, I want you to be seen by a psychiatrist. I want to have an official diagnosis, and I'm yeah. happy to be part of that. I can I help do the with the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Next, researchers at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York say a new blood test could help predict the severity of food allergies. How, Holly, how does this test work? Well, Anthony, right now the, the primary testing that's, that's done for food allergies is a series of skin prick tests. Uh, now, they can tell you if you are allergic to a food, but they can't tell you how severe your reaction might be. Uh, so researchers have developed a new potential test. It's called a basophil activation test, and it measures levels of certain immune cells in the blood that can actually predict how severe your reaction might be. And that's, that's really important. Right now, to figure out severity, we basically have to give patients who are allergic a little bit of the food and see what happens, see what happens which is yeah. clearly terrifying. Oh, is this only for research purposes at this point, or are we going to start to see it on the market? Well, I don't know when it's going to be on the market, but the reason why it's so important is that, uh, Holly mentioned, it can be terrifying. It can be scary when you give somebody a peanut. You're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. Here, you're putting the, the peanut protein into a test tube, and you're seeing the reaction outside of the body. So whatever happens, you can measure it there, and the person's perfectly fine. All right, new research from Johns Hopkins University sheds light on how babies learn. Holly, tell us about this study. Well, it's actually all about the element of surprise. So, <laughs> uh, you know, we know that infants have sort of an innate knowledge about how the world works, even though they're, they're very, very young. Um, and when you challenge that knowledge, that's when they seem most intrigued. So these researchers at Johns Hopkins did a very interesting study. One of the things they did, they took a ball and they rolled it down an incline mm. into a wall. Of course, the infants expect the ball to stop when it hits the wall. Now, source sort of threw a, a slide of hand. They created a situation so that it looked like the ball was rolling down an incline and through a wall. Right. After that, the infants were absolutely, you know, glued to the set. They wanted to hold the ball. They wanted to bounce it off the floor. They wanted to explore it further, uh -huh. kind of like scientists do. So it implies that there's an element, you know, using the element of surprise or challenging what we expect is what helps us to learn. Oh, aside from being, I'm sure, a, a hugely entertaining, why would they want to study infants? Well, these are basic fundamental questions about learning, right? I remember when one of my sons was three months old thinking, he is going to learn more in the next three months than I will learn for the rest of my life. <laughs> that and is it's terrifying. it's astounding to see how they learn. And are they really blank slates? Which yes. clearly they're not. They're born actually with some wiring that lets them figure out how to learn. And I find that just fascinating. Finally, surprising events may help babies learn, but a study uncovers something that may not help adults, at least as much as we think. New research from Yale University finds internet searches can make people feel smarter than they actually are. <laughs> I mean, how many Google experts do we know? No, right. I know everything about this subject. I Googled it. Yeah, and, and it's actually not just a research subject. I mean, Theoretically, it's interesting, but also in real life, it can be dangerous yeah. to think you know more than you know. And especially in medicine, there are some facts you just have to have in your head. If somebody comes yeah. into my office, they're from West Africa, and they have a fever, yeah. I better be thinking, do they right. have Ebola? And the other problem is you have to remember that all those quote-unquote facts on Google or the Internet aren't always facts. Yeah. I've learned that the hard way several times. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> what are you saying? True. I'm, I'm surprised by this. <laughs> I'm interested in learning. All right. Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thanks so much.